Good morning, everybody. Um, the speaker I'm going to introduce this morning has needs no introduction at New Life Church, but for those who don't know Professor David Block, I will tell you a little bit about him. Dr. Block is an astronomer and has a long career researching the various intricacies of the universe. He's written many books and published scores of academic articles in top um, scientific journals of the world. His career started when he pointed his little telescope as a teenager heavenwards and became absolutely intrigued in the workings of the universe. Most importantly, he gazed through the telescope and started, through the telescope started wondering, how does this all fit together? Is there a designer? Um, is there purpose to the universe? Is there meaning to, to, to my life? And uh, I was just getting ready this morning at home and this, was listening, listening to the, psalm, the Psalms, and this is what came up, and I thought this was, this was great for Dr. Block. Uh, psalm 8, verse 3 and 4. When I look at the night sky and see the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars you've set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? And uh, so Dr. Block, after spending many, many years uh, um, uh, resting with this, uh, how this, how the universe is so beautifully put together and there's beautiful bodies like Saturn and and uh, glorious planets. He was a young Jewish Orthodox man, and he became convinced that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And after, after the next 45 years, is his journey of faith, led by the, his creator, and uh, he's had a wonderful life, married to his first girlfriend, Liz, who's a fellow uh, Jewish believer, and they share uh, three awesome adult sons. So please give a warm new life welcome to Dr. Dave Block. Thank you, Thank you so much. What a great joy to be here this morning. Thank you to Pastor Chris. Thank you to Rosalie. Thank you to Ryan. Thank you to Tion, thank you to Eddie, thank you to so many people who've made this morning possible, and welcome to each one of you and to each one of you online. My talk this morning concerns crisis and crises, and the emphasis is going to be how to practice the renewed mind of Jesus with a subtitle, The Tribe Has Not Spoken. And I'll weave that out as we proceed. Beloved, we are living in times of uh, global crisis. I think of COVID, 575 million cases, infections. 6.4 million deaths. Climate change, 1 billion animals, 1 billion animals die in Australia alone during the raging bushfires of uh, 2020. But what concerns me is that there are so many voices screaming at us. Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. But then I just put up a little mosaic of uh, voices that come into your world, Zoom and Telegram and Facebook and Instagram and WeChat and much besides. And I realize more and more that humanity is in a crisis mode. The thermometers are very high. You know, COVID also precipitated a divorce rate which is almost unprecedented in history. Every 42 seconds, there is one divorce in the United States. People cannot cope. People cannot 
cope under the financial strains placed upon us by these crises. There are three divorces in the United States in the time it takes for a couple to recite their wedding vows of two minutes. And so God laid on my heart in crisis mode, how do I, how do I cope with my struggles? And I sought the Lord here so that I can give you something concrete to take home, something that you can devour every day. And I'll explain how you can do that a little later on. But in crisis mode, the raging crisis of COVID, which are now passing, praise the Lord, how do I cope with my internal, personal struggles? And the answer is found in Romans 12 and verse 2. It's a very, very difficult recipe to implement in your mind. And you'll see why as we proceed. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, do not conform yourselves, do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you, but let God transform you. Inwardly, this is not outward processing, this is inward. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let, allow, open up, be free inside. Let God transform you, make you anew, inwardly, not outwardly by something very interesting, a complete change of your mind. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then, then, Hanley and everyone else, you will be able to know the will of God. All of us live to know the will of God, want to know the will of God. But then, after the renewing of your mind, you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and what is pleasing to Him and is perfect. We all strive for that, to want to know the will of God, to know what is good, to know what is pleasing to Him and what is perfect. It all hinges on one anchor, to be transformed inwardly by a complete change of your mind. But how do we do this? First of all, I want to encourage you that God can view your struggles in a new light. The glasses that God wears are not my glasses. The glasses that God wears are the eyes that God has, the eyes that Jesus has, are spiritual eyes. Yes, he was made flesh, as in John chapter one, but God, the question is, in my struggles, can God view my struggles in a new light? And as a professor of astronomy, I'd like to introduce you to something very important, which you'll see on the screen behind me, and that is the electromagnetic spectrum. And we have the spectral range from gamma to X-ray to UV to optical and then to infrared. And God has been showing me a remarkable secret in the infrared region of the spectrum. And he's been doing this for me for over 35 years. And a lot of this might sound very technical, so let's get right back to base camp and look at Erythrina abyssinia. And this is an optical image. So this is a kind of image you would secure through, say, using a mobile phone. 
and you can see the optical colors of the blue sky. Many people, I remember asking my students, why is the sky blue? And many of them might say, Professor, because there's lots of water in the, on the earth. But of course, that's not true. The earth blew, blew due to rally scattering. Tiny little dust particles scatter the, blue, uh, scatter the blue light and the sky appears blue. And you see the sunlight impinging upon these flowers. But the reason I'm showing you this is they're scarlet. They're scarlet in color. They're red in color. But now let's take off our glasses, our optical glasses, and let's put on, figuratively, some infrared ones. And let's see what we can see. Suddenly, all the scarlet becomes white. The same flower, but in the infrared spectrum, using infrared camera array technology, everything is perfect for everything is white, as in the book of Revelation. Everything is perfect. Everything is white. Everything is spotless. Everything is clean. Everything is perfect. Everything is beautiful. Everything is holy, as in the book of Revelation. What has happened to transform us? It's infrared technology. And God has said, why don't you realize that? And he gave me this verse in Isaiah, chapter one and verse 18. Come now, let us settle the matter, saith the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, like scarlet is in those flowers, they shall be white, as snow, though they be red as crimson, they shall be like wool. But now I've shown you the same flowers using different lenses, different eyes. The one is blazing red, the same flower, beautiful, white, spotless, and it applies to you. Though you sit in your room, and though you may condemn yourself as unclean and as unfit to serve the risen Lord Jesus, though you might condemn yourself, know this, though my sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool. Though my sins be as scarlet as flowing red blood. They shall be white as snow, as pure as wool. And so when you're going through a crisis, always ask yourself, in your mind, through which lens are you evaluating God's love for you in your storm-tossed boats? Try and remember the lesson today. There's another universe out there. All you need to do is take these off and put on God's infrared eyes, as it were. And the universe is totally different in the red. I remember Pastor Chris reaching me the other day after I was on television with the James Webb Space Telescope. And everything looks different because we're using infrared technology. He sent me a little note, such an encouraging note he did, because we're using new eyes. Another thought I want to leave with you this morning is in a crisis, how do I change my mindset to one of a champion? And I want to give you some lessons from a firefly. These are amazing little creatures. Fireflies are sometimes called glowworms, firebobs, candleflies, lightning bugs, and so on and so on. So on. But the interesting thing is they glow in the dark. And what also do you see in the dark are stars. Now fireflies are exceedingly small, as you can see on this book cover over here. Fireflies, glow worms, and lightning bugs. They're exceedingly tiny. But the problem is in the next slide is that fireflies mimic stars. 
of an early evening, if you go outside in a region where there are fireflies, they look just like stars glowing in the dark. But they are fireflies. I did a little bit of research when writing my book on this, which includes fireflies. Different species light up for fractions of a second. Photinus sabulosus, a tenth of a second, is the light up period. Photinus pyralis, the males stay lit up for three quarters of a second. But a friend of mine was outside of an evening. This is an incredible image. And it shows you the stars at night moving, so it's a long time exposure. But then you see the fireflies. And you can't really see the difference. Yes, the one's yellow and the stars are white and blue and so forth. But you can't really tell the difference in this photograph between the star and the firefly. However, in this image here, you can see the sun, the raging, seething sun, and then something which mimics the sun. It actually goes and mimics the sun, a firefly. I did a little math calculation for you. How many Earths could you fit into the sun if the Earth were hollow, if the sun were hollow? You can fit in 1.3 million Earths into a hollow sun, which gives you an idea of how large the sun really is. But here's the rub which God gave me. If the stars and fireflies had voices, which voice would I listen to? You see, in my career as a professor of applied maths and astronomy, many voices have reached my desk over the years, many different voices, multitudes of voices, some very encouraging and some utterly discouraging. And I have to ask myself this question always, even as I stand here today, are the words being spoken to me emanating from a star or from a firefly? They both look almost the same, but the one is a majestic star like our sun, and the other is a firefly. And the analogy that I'm giving you this morning caught the attention of a Nobel laureate, Tagore, who penned these words, and I love them. The learned say that your lights will be no more, said the firefly to the stars. The stars made no answer. Never try and convince a firefly. Never. You get it on Facebook all the time. They tell me the earth is flat. Never argue, never, 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 as in Churchill. Never try and convince fireflies. Rather go and get me this that Rosalie got me, some good grape ties. It's good advice, beloved. You'll save yourself some stress. In a crisis, how do I survive? Well, let's go to Survivor. You all know the television series Survivor, and in Survivor, um, there's always this famous council voting session, and somebody has to be voted out by the tribe of participants. And somebody is voted out, it can be a very ugly business, voting behind the backs of others, but it's a great television series. And the final words are, as the person who's going to exit leaves is, the host says, the tribe has spoken. And they extinguish their candle or their flame. And God's voice came to me. God's voice came to me, Ryan. And God's voice said to me, the tribe has not spoken. The tribe has not spoken. Now, where do we encounter tribes, beloved? 
tribes, in other words, groups of people who might try and hunt us down in our crisis mode. Tribes may be at school, at university, at work, and sometimes at home. Brothers, sisters might gang up against one another. Parents might gang up against their children and vice versa. And I want to urge you today that you must understand that when you look at a person's mouth and they're speaking, ask yourself this question always, I do, who is speaking? That's why I can listen to the voice of Jesus all the time because he has created all these stars. But are the words emanating from a majestic star or from a firefly? Stars glow for billions of years. Fireflies grow, glow for a tenth of a second. But they try and burst your bubble. They, they know exactly the tribe how to detonate you, how to diffuse you in your spirit from love, joy, peace. I remember a message the other day. Someone said to me, just had a conversation. I'm just in a roller coaster mode. You've got to always understand this. Who is doing the talking? Of course, we are in a spiritual warfare. We, we fight not against flesh and blood. Now, let me make this little, a little bit personal, just for a moment. In a time of crisis, God says to me and says to you, always remember, Dave, that though you're surrounded by people, say at university, who might be very negative towards God, the tribe has not spoken the final word. You know, I remember the deputy vice chancellor at Wits University coming down to my office. And I was greatly encouraged that she was coming down to my office. It's like Queen Elizabeth coming to meet you in the streets of London. Well, not quite, but you get the point. And uh, she said to me, we're so proud of you, Professor Block. You're the only scientist in Africa. And one of the few in the world whose research has been featured twice on the cover of Nature. And I said to her, I'm greatly humbled at what you are saying to me. But I knew she had come down to see me for another reason. That was the entree, the spice. The camembert cheese. And she said, but could you please shut up about God? Those were her words. Could you please shut up? She'd seen me on television over all the years. She'd heard me on radio over all the years. She said, could you please just shut up? It's in my books, those statements about God. And so you have tribes of people. She was part of the senior management team at Wits, including the vice chancellor. And you're surrounded by these tribes. And you are a vulnerable one, saying Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I said to that lady, which is your favorite book, she said to me, David, my favorite book is The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. You must understand who is doing the talking. But you know, I encountered my tribe at high school. Masculinity was enmeshed in the SADF culture in apartheid South Africa. The army, they said, would make a man out of you. It was the white male rite of passage. And the state had its reservoirs, such as our high school, from which young white members of the SADF were drawn. Cadets were an integral part of high school. White male conscription was compulsory. Around 600,000 white males conscripted in the period 1968 when it became compulsory to 1993. Our principal in high school was a commandant. Military title. And there the bullies decided to get hold of me because I was defying a culture. 
You see? I was defying the, I was encountering the defining culture of masculinity. If you were a man in 1970s, you played rugby or you played sport and you participated in cadets if you were male. And so one day we were in cadets and uh, I'm not very worried about how my army boots shine. It's, it's quite foreign to me, Ryan. It's, it's foreign. I don't know it. I, to me, in army boots and how they shine and reflect my nose and so on, is not, it's not really my cup of tea. My wife always checks that I have the correct pants on to match my jacket. And so army boots are not really part and parcel of Dave Block. And so, in cadets one day, I was punched. The only problem was that I was hospitalized after I was punched. And I couldn't sit after I was punched. You know, I remember being hospitalized for 22 days. I was, couldn't sit. And so, I was faced by my tribe. And in this image over here, the hunted one, you can see the cross wires, and that's what tribes try and do to you in your struggles, is they try and hunt you down. They, they align their cross wires ever so carefully. But though the waters rage, but though the waters rage, I stood my ground, well, I wasn't standing, I don't think, I was kneed in the spine. I don't think I was standing. I can't quite recall. But what I can recall is this. It was as if the skies had broken loose. There's a saying in English, the skies had fallen. And in that moment, you have to ask yourself, is there room for anyone in this world with a fragile heart? But then I have to put on God's lenses. But then I have to look at the situation through God's eyes. But then I have to evaluate the situation through God's perspective and say, is there room for anyone in this world with a fragile or with a broken heart? One of my favorite little books is this one, Snowflake by Paul Gallego. And it tells a story of one little snowflake. And in the story, we read these words. Looking at herself, that's the snowflake, as she tumbled over and over, fragile and airy and so on and so on. Slow snowflake knew that she was beautiful. Self-esteem is at an all-time low. I see people all the time, and I meet with people who just look as if they're simply surviving. Some of us are perhaps only simply surviving. But God caused me to pen these words, which I want to share with you today. As long as I know that one fragile snowflake falls to the ground, there is room for anyone with a fragile or with a broken heart. Now, in a crisis, why does no one notice my suffering at night when I am alone with myself? And I often think of the two people walking. Jesus has been crucified, and they're walking, feeling very despondent, and they cannot see Jesus. Their Jesus has been crucified, and they're walking on the road to Emmaus, and they feel, as in Luke 24, utterly downcast. And people say to me, Professor, can you give me something to take home in such a situation? Well, in this slide, yes. Use the camera test. Use the camera test. Now, in the next slide, what is the camera test? Imagine if there was a little mobile phone, which there wasn't, but imagine if there was. A selfie would show two people walking alone. But what is the truth? The camera test is take out an infrared camera. 
This is not infrared, but let's suppose it's an infrared camera. What would the camera test show me? How many people are walking on the road to Emmaus? Three. The optical camera says there are two. But the truth is three are walking to Emmaus. Jesus is always in my boat. And in this beautiful picture by Rembrandt, you see Jesus coming to dine with him after traversing the road to Emmaus. I think, too, of Mark chapter 4. The disciples are on a severe crisis. There's a storm in Mark chapter 4. And people often feel that their boat is being tossed in all directions. And I always say to them, use the camera test. Use the camera test. Use the camera test. Jesus is in your boat. An infrared camera or a spiritual camera would show you something different. You, are, you have to, the Scriptures say, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to look at it through spiritual eyes. You have to use a spiritual camera test or you'll be dead. Always use that spiritual camera test, always knowing that Jesus is in your boat. You know, I want to ask you this question today. In my desert, where is Jesus? In my desert, where is Jesus? Again, God said to me as I was preparing this little message for you today, use the camera test. And I want to, I urge you, I want to put one slide up here of a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse. And what's happening here, beloved, is very simple. The face of the moon is obscuring that of the sun. You can see it so clearly. The face of the moon is obscuring that of the sun. And I had a call yesterday from someone, and they said, I'm in a desert. Where is Jesus? I'm in a desert. And I can share with you how to get out of that mode of thinking. What is the moon? A tiny piece of rock. What's eclipsing the sun? That tiny piece of rock, the moon, is eclipsing the sun. And one thing I want to tell you is a stone of sin in your life and in my life can eclipse the sun. Very powerful. What stone is in your shoe this morning? and in my shoe, because if you've ever tried to walk with a stone in your shoe, you'll know what I'm talking about. You have to take away the stone. You have to. It's part of being transformed by the renewing of your mind. You say, Dave, Dave, give me Scripture. Well, here it is, John 11, 39 to 40. John 11, 39, Jesus says, take away the stone. Before he raises Lazarus from the dead, he says, take away the stone. And afterwards he says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And I believe many of us who might find ourselves in desert experiences are finding ourselves eclipsed because a tiny little stone, like the moon, a tiny little stone can eclipse the sun. Sometimes S-U-N, but sometimes S-O-N. And when you remove that stone, the sun blazes in all its radiance. Because we are told in Scripture, in Proverbs and Pastor Chris has been preaching a wonderful series on wisdom. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. You know, I think of multitudes of my students who might be sitting out there looking at their phones or WhatsApp or whatever. They're feeling so good. They've got up of the morning. They're feeling so good. They cast their eye and... Just like that, a stone eclipses their joy. Just like that, they find themselves in a desert 
because someone is out to deflate or detonate their ego. And I want to encourage you, beloved, always remember the eclipse analogy. Whenever I get a WhatsApp or however I receive my messages, I have to ask myself some questions. Are, are these words emanating from a star or from a firefly? Are these words encouraging or not? If not, I have to transform my mind. I have to allow God to transform my mind. I'll tell you why. Our lives are based on perceptions. And I want to read this. It's quite a little twister. So I want us just to read this. I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. You look very worried because you don't understand it. Maybe. So let me unpack it. I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. Hanley's got it, thank God. You see, perceptions... This little slide really encourages me here. The difference between fact and fake. There's so much fake news. There's so much fact. I remember dealing with a man in Hawaii. He was in crisis mode. And he said to me, David, and he stood by this garbage cans, and he said, David, I feel like garbage. Wonderful Christian. But he was self-condemning mode, you understand that? Self-condemning mode. He said, I feel like garbage. And I looked at him and I said to him, I can't remember exactly what I said to him, but something along these lines. Mentioned his name and I said, you know, in God's eyes, you are beloved of him. I am beloved of God, John 3, 16. I'm not trash. The tribe might say that I'm trash, but I'm not trash because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. I am not trash. And Joe, that's not his real name, Joe, you are not trash either. See, that's how you get transformed, by the renewing of your mind. You are unique and you are replaceable. In a crisis, only listen to his still, small voice, only. My sheep, listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them. No tribe, there you go, no tribe will snatch them out of my hands. You know, I looked at us, I was writing a book and I looked at this little guy on a pillar just fishing and God dropped something wonderful into my spirit. I can't recall exactly where I saw it, but it's so true. It goes like this. Religion is a guy in church thinking about fishing. So the guy's in church and he's thinking about fishing. Relationship is a guy out there fishing thinking about God. I just love that. Religion is a guy in church wishing he was somewhere else fishing. Relationship is a guy out there fishing thinking about God. And as I bring my message up to a close, I pondered, how might I give you a real dessert to take away this morning in crisis mode? And that is, in a crisis, can science help me to understand my reactions? In a crisis, can science help me to understand my reactions. And so God implanted on my heart to show you an image 
of a tea bag. Now, I don't know, some of you might like rooibos tea. Some of you might prefer the Earl Grey variety and so forth. But whenever you place a tea bag in hot water, the hot water only brings out of the tea bag what is already in the tea bag. Hot water only brings out of a tea bag what's in the tea bag. And so you might say to me, Prof, how does this relate at all to crisis mode and the way that I am thinking? Well, only this. In a crisis, hot water only brings out of a tea bag what is already in the tea bag. And you might say to me, well, Prof, just unpack that a little more. So I thought of two hypothetical scenarios. My dad made me lose my temper, or my mom made me lose my temper. No! Look inside here. Hot water only brings out of my heart what's already in my heart. You know, we tend to always blame, but she made me lose my temper, but he made me do this, and he's responsible. No! That's not scientifically correct, and it's not scripturally correct. Hot water only brings out of a tea bag what's already in the tea bag. In a crisis, the attitude of my mother-in-law stinks, and I always start shouting at her, really? No. In a crisis, the secret is never to react, but to respond. It's powerful. But here you sit today at New Life, and those of you watching me online, and I've given you many different recipes, take-home recipes, and they all center around this verse. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of mind. You might say to me, Dave, where can I read up more about this? I've written a whole book unpacking the renewed mind of Jesus in crisis. Liz has brought some copies today. It's called The Tribe Has Not Spoken. And it's endorsed by a survivor of Auschwitz who writes. The survivor of Auschwitz writes on the cover, In the hell of bullying, hope flowers. On the darkest of nights, the stars shine the brightest. Be ye transformed, beloved, by a complete change of your mind. The clock is at zero, 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 and I am done. But allow me to pray. <clears throat> Father, what a privilege to call you that, Abba Father. We sometimes try and confuse our earthly fathers with our heavenly Father and their wrath and their anger at times. But Father, oh, to experience here at the pulpit your grace and your mercy, Lord, which Freddie leads us to all the time, reminds us of over and over again. Father, Bless this awesome congregation, I pray, Lord. Bless, as in the ironic blessing, bless the incoming and the outgoing, Lord, and bless them in all their ways. And Father, if anyone is struggling this morning with any addictions, if anyone is struggling, Lord, with any crises, I pray for them. I pray that they will be transformed, transformed by a complete renewing of their mind. Thank you for this time together. Bless all those watching online as well. In Jesus' incomparable name, amen. Amen and amen and shalom. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful word. Will you stand with us? We're gonna sing a song as just a response from our, this beautiful word, Professor Block.
Lindsay, thank you so much for making time to be with New Life Church this morning and just inspiring our community. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken Oh, cause my fear doesn't Stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your And I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance There's power that can break up every chain. Oh, there's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. Hallelujah. Will you give Jesus praise? He is worthy of our praise. We love you, Lord. Before we leave this morning at New Life, we never end a service without giving you the opportunity to give your life to Jesus if you haven't do so before. Would we'll you just close your eyes as every head is bowed this morning? You heard the message so beautifully spoken this morning. Realizing that we all have fallen short of God's glory. 
that in time of trouble, in worry, shame, heartache, hurt, there is a light. And as Professor Block said this morning, we just need to let the sun come in. Let the sun who sets you free. And when he sets you free, you are free indeed. So this morning, I want to ask you, if you've never invited Jesus, the Son of God, into your life, will you pray this prayer with us this morning? Open your heart and pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you were prepared to die for me on the cross of Calvary. Today, Lord, I declare that I need you. And I ask you to become my king and my savior. This morning, I turn my back on the world and my past sins. And I know that as I invite you, Jesus, into my life, I walk into a new life with you. A life where there is hope and a future and a destiny that is found in Jesus. I belong to you. You belong to me. I am your son. I am your daughter. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Will you give Jesus praise for every person that prayed that prayer today? Once again, Professor Block, thank you so much. We love having you. You're part of the family. We love you and your family. Thank you so much. And um, please remember, Professor Block's book is on sale in the foyer. God bless you. We have our prayer team to pray with you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Until we see each other again next week, God bless you all.